God. And it's not that God is not pleased. It's that your life will get into trouble. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. And you, how many of you are at a place in life where you're pretty good where you are, but, and so you're, but you're content, but you don't have that passion to go. There's no adventure with where you are. But if, if I'm going to go up another level, I've got to risk some stuff. Don't stay where you are. I'd rather fail chasing a dream than succeed staying plateaued. So I turn with my life and I go, I'm going for another level. And I add works to my faith. I'm believing God for something I've never done before. And I'm up there and I go it again. There are no end of the gears that you can shift into as you continue to grow. But the enemy's trick is to get you to feel stressed, maxed, or your set point. For those who work out, your set point is reached and you just can't imagine. You've hit a ceiling. There are no ceilings. There are no ceilings. God's not the one holding you back. But if the enemy can get you to feel stressed, Max, oh, this is just too much. I can't imagine going any further than this. And, and I, I'm just hard. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, listen to this. Now to him, by the consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare to ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, our highest desires, our highest thoughts, our highest hopes, our highest dreams. Everything about God is he has made you to never stop growing for eternity. Forget 70 years, eternity. You hit 60 and you think, oh, retirement 65. You know, this is the only gift I got. I found the whole two gifts I've got. You have an incredible amount of gifts that will take you forever to determine. You're designed to live forever. You've been made to rise and go. And when religion begins to teach you, just be happy, just be satisfied, stay where you are. This is the Amplified in Ephesians 3.20. It says, this exceedingly abundantly has a purpose. It's to carry out God's purpose. Business people are sitting here right now thinking, well, you know, Leon, there's just, I, I just, I, it's not so much the money, it's the love of the, of course it is. Of course it is. Well, Leon, I like making money. Is that a sin? Are you kidding me? That's not even in the Bible that it's wrong. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. People without it love it more than often people with it. It's the love of money. But then what about a guy who is amazing at playing the piano? I just hate playing piano, but I'm the best one at it. No, he loves playing the piano, which is why he's so good at it. And if you're here and you like, you, I love chess. It's not because you get beaten by everybody. Why do you love chess? Because you beat everybody. Well, why do you love something? Because you're good at it. So for business, people are going, well, you know, I mean, our bills are paid and, and we go on good holidays. And I just don't want to, you know, just, you know, I, I just need to be satisfied. No, be content with who you are in Christ. But if you've been given a business, a, a something on the inside of you to raise up organizations, the presence of God is on you for that. And you can, there's no end to where God can take you. You just got to remember, stop being selfish with it and do it for his purposes. And if you don't do it for his purposes, you'll find that wherever you are, it'll cost you something. There's, there's not this ability from God to go to that next level. And so I want to challenge you, you know, make sure that you're plugged into a local church, planted in the house of the Lord. Make sure you're volunteering, make sure you're giving, tithing, so that as you continue to prosper, this selfish side of all of us, which has to be crucified every day. I crucify, the Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 12, it does it, make your body a living sacrifice. That's like, that's not, that doesn't make sense. That's like saying that, you know, a living sacrifice means you kill it. You sacrifice it. But you're a living sacrifice. We've got to die to self. But God's called us to move on. And I want you to know, everybody here, I don't care how stressed you are, how bad things are going. I don't care if your marriage is driving you nuts and you can't handle another month with this person. Guess what? The rest of your married life, there's just going to be new things to, to argue about and talk about and go to a whole new level. Marriage is not just about someone that you can marry that can look after me. No, a marriage, first of all, isn't for love.
so you're saying marry someone you don't love. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the Bible says seek first the kingdom of God. Your marriage's purpose first is to help God's kingdom advance, which is helping get rid of the little baby in you and the self-centered narcissistic you and learn to love. A marriage is one of the most amazing places to learn to die to self and to love. And so you're always going to be, you know, conflict about this, talking through this. Marriage is not like tiptoe to the tulips. And, and we, you know, one person said to me, we've been married 15 years. We haven't had a fight yet. No, oh, really? I said, well, you're, you're, your marriage is the one that just disappears overnight because somebody is sucking up to the other one, putting up with something if you don't have some good old fights. Not talking physical. I mean, learn to fight fair. Learn to deal with your stuff. I mean, the last fight Sally and I had, she came crawling back on her hands and knees. And she said, come out from underneath that bed and fight like a man. The enlargement of your life is a God thing. Getting better at relationships is a God thing. Financing more money is a God thing. Building greater friendships is a God thing. Knowing God better is a God thing. Having a greater relationship circle, getting planted in local church. God wants to advance your life. Now let me show you how to increase your capacity. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 23. I'm going to tell you the story really quickly. The Bible says, this is how the kingdom of heaven works. First line of verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like this. And then it tells a story of a, of a master who gets his three servants together. He's going on a long trip. And it says he gives one guy five bags of gold. Now one bag of gold takes a laborer about 20 years to earn. And he gives one guy five bags. He gives another guy two bags. And he gives a third guy one bag. Now you say, well, why does the guy with five get five and the guy with two get two and the guy with two? No, the Bible says they were each given an amount of money that matched their ability. Okay? So then it says he went away. And when he came back, he called the servants to task. The guy with five said, Master, I took the five, and here's five more, here's ten. The guy with two said, here's the two you gave me, and I made two more, buying and trading. And the guy with one walks up with his head kind of hanging down, and here's his excuses. Oh, I knew you were a hard man, and so I didn't want to lose it. And I knew... You what would you change in your life? What if you could unleash the miraculous in your everyday life? Experience freedom. Live in peace. Change the world. Become Spirit Contemporary. Join Leon Fontaine, world-renowned conference speaker, senior pastor of Canada's fastest-growing church, and CEO of Canada's only Christian TV station. Learn to rise up and have victory. Do great exploits, Daniel said. The people who know their God, people who know the word, who know their covenant with him, which is through Jesus. It says you can do great exploits, not me, you. We're talking about you. In John 10.10, 10, it says that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So why is there such a disconnect between this biblical promise and how most Christians live today? Why have so many believers become spiritually weak and ineffective at sharing Jesus' message of love? The Spirit contemporary life is the answer. It's being led by Holy Spirit, but in a contemporary way. It's being Jesus and demonstrating His love in ways people can understand and appreciate. Spirit contemporary is unique for everyone. It never compromises the truth and it never makes others feel uncomfortable. It's freeing yourself from religious constraints and walking freely in God's amazing grace for His purpose. The Spirit Contemporary Life is absolutely crucial if the global church and her people are going to change the world.
And now, from Winnipeg, Canada, Pastor Leon Fontaine. The greatest hindrance in your life, the thing that stops you the most from going where you want to go, whether it's relationships, thinking, finances, God, the greatest thing that stops you is you. People don't like to hear that. We need to grow up in our faith when it comes to being a believer. It says that all through the Word. It's, Paul will say it in different ways. He'll say, grow up. Get past the basic doctrines. It's time to begin to recognize God's Word and know it more so than just, and he'll even list the basic doctrines. Do you spend enough time in God's Word to get past just the basics? Are you still begging and pleading and wondering why things aren't working? In Psalm 78, 41, it says, Again and again the children of Israel tempted God and they limited Him in their lives. It was a fantastic day for me when this revelation exploded on the inside of me that I am my greatest limitation. I can do something about every area of my life that has lack. I can do something if the curse is walking its way through an area of my life, if the promises aren't coming true, if things I'm believing for, new seasons of my life aren't happening. It was an amazing thing to recognize that it's me. I'm the one limiting God. And then rather than get offended or angry or mad, to dive into the Word and say, Holy Spirit, guide me, lead me, show me what I can do to rise up, to grow. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4 are four stunning verses. Four verses that bring such clarity to the new covenant. And it starts out by saying here in that Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained precious faith. Let's stop right there. If you've got something that is precious to you, it's very valuable to you. And here it's talking about faith, but he uses the word precious faith. That means that there is a faith that the believer has in the new covenant that is very precious. Why? Because it produces every time. The Bible does not say some mountains move when spoken to. The Bible does not say that you can have faith, real heart faith, and things still won't move. It doesn't teach that. Those are the teachings of, of human people trying to reason their way through the Bible when they can't get results. One of the most important things you'll do out of this message today is to begin to believe I am what's limiting my life. Nothing else. God is not limiting your life. The enemy doesn't have the power to now. He could be by turning your beliefs against you, turning your power against you, but that's just you again limiting because you won't deal and understand what it is that the enemy really has for, how does he do it? Well, he's called the accuser. He's called a liar. He's called a deceiver. It's not called, he's not called powerful. He's not called amazing. He's not called omnipresent. He's not called omniscient. He's not, no called a liar, a deceiver, an accuser, which means when things go wrong in your life, he is going to try to work you to believe a lie. You, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you have a precious faith. You have a faith that works. So many people today, they're looking at this and they're saying, Leon, are we in the last days? Well, of course we are. Of course we're in the last days. And then we bring up all the crazy teachings that are out there on the end times. And the ones I call crazy are the ones where believers who believe in the promises and the new agreement still don't have an ability to rise up in victory. That is so wrong. 
He's not coming back for a wiped out church. Jesus is returning for a church without spot and wrinkle, a victorious church. The promises of God still work. Daniel, who is wrote prolifically about the end times under the inspiration of Holy Spirit, even pinpointed countries and things that history shows us have happened. Daniel wrote about them before they happened. We can look back on this thousands of years later and see everything that he said that happened. One of the things he says in verse 32 of Daniel 11, he's talking here, and he says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. That's the first part of the verse, and he's just talking about the enemy trying to come in, but this is what it says. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great Great exploits. It doesn't say, you know, in brackets, well, except towards the end of the world, except towards the end of time. No, great exploits will always be done by people who know their God, by people who have who understand faith, who understand this new covenant, who believe. It says so clearly, you need to write this on your fridge somewhere, Daniel eleven thirty two. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Peter, Second Peter chapter 1 again, where we're talking here about how that we have a precious faith. This precious faith is, has an ability to believe. Now people think, well, Leon, how much faith is needed? You see, faith is, they used to teach things like faith will move the hand of God. Now, I don't know what they mean by that because it's not accurate as far as God is waiting and then if you believe, he'll do it. He's saying to you and I here in 2 Peter chapter 1 that I've already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Where did he give them? He's placed them within Jesus and Jesus is within our spirit as it's a done deal. It's yours. And it's simply believe. Your faith is precious. Are you feeding your faith the word of God? Or are you feeding your doubts? You know, if I took a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and I chained them here so they could fight, you say, well, the Great Dane's going to win. But what if I stop feeding the Great Dane, but I feed the Chihuahua? Eventually, that Great Dane, that huge dog, is going to lay there with hardly an ounce of energy left. All the Chihuahua's got to do is walk over there and put his tiny little teeth around the windpipe and do a little bit of a bite and help him to die. Whatever you feed becomes powerful in your life. And whatever you don't feed. So because we live on a fallen planet with an enemy, you are so uh, uh, drawn and focused on what CNN says and, and what people are saying. And, and then you want to be entertained. I've worked so hard. I just need to be entertained. Tonight I'm going to watch six sessions of my favorite new TV series on Netflix. And you'll sit there in this mouth hanging open, drool coming out of your, off your side of your mouth, just going through, just put my brain on tilt. I don't want to put my brain on tilt. I, don't, I enjoy good movies and things at times, but I want to feed my mind the word of God, renewing it every day. I want to feed on the bread of life, which is the word of God. Because when you do, you can actually get up and go live a life rather than watching somebody else have an exciting life on TV. Get one yourself. Learn to rise up and have victory. Do great exploits, Daniel said. The people who know their God, people who know the word, who know their covenant with him, which is through Jesus. It says you can do great exploits, not me, you. We're talking about you. So many people have faith in certain leaders and certain things, but you need to make God's word so personal that it's about you. In this portion of scripture here, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it says here that grace and peace are multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now, peace is not as the world gives. There is a peace, and this peace that comes from God will make you look so confident 
that people will want you in leadership. The peace of God will make you look so attractive. It'll make you look so together. And even though you know it's his peace, now the world can't have the peace of Jesus. Think of the most confident person, the most able person, and if they do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and have said so, then that peace is not a godly peace. It's a facial expression. It's an ability to think under pressure and stress. But they do not know a peace that passes understanding. They do not have a peace that is not as the world gives. And you'll see it because it'll destroy them on the inside. Disease will begin to rise up. It'll put pressure on their relationships. It'll cause them to get so unifocused that they can't enjoy every area of life because they got such a big organization to run or they got so many battles to fight and you wonder okay what's going on but there is a peace and this peace is multiplied in your life as you learn about Jesus it says here in second Peter 1 you see you can have a great gifting and you can achieve great things but if you don't have God's peace the very greatness and the very success that you get will destroy important things in your life it'll destroy your peace it'll destroy other areas it's kind of like this building that I'm, I'm standing in right now, and, and they quickly put it together for me. They did a great job, but this is designed, these pillars, to hold up one floor. If we put a second floor on it, that might hold it. If we put a third floor on it, we might hold it. If we put a fifth floor on it, at some point, the very success and growth of this building, growing it up, will destroy it because the foundations won't support it. The foundations of our lives are Jesus, his word, the powerful principles of God. And if you can find success without them for a while, it will cost you. What will cost you? Success without Jesus will cost you. Stop looking at this planet as though this is where you get a life as though this is the only place. So you have to have a bucket list. I've got to run with the bulls. I've got to glide the Grand Canyon. I've, and you got all these, but no, listen, it doesn't matter how much you do or don't get done on this planet because Jesus is going to rebuild. There's going to be a new earth one day and it's going to be without all of the, the things that make it hard to handle and it's going to be even better than it is and you'll be able to see and enjoy and do things for eternity. But to think that your life is these short 70 years on this planet is a lie of the enemy. And so I want to encourage you today that this divine power hath given to us, the next verse says, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Again, it is saying that what is limiting you is your knowledge. Yeah, well, Leon, I just rely on the verse that says, you know, I just call out to God and he answers. I know the Bible has some great escape clauses that if you need something, you can call out to him, all right? But I've got news for you. The Bible says it's time to grow up. It'll say things like, God once winked at our ignorance, but now expects us. You see, Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, and his job is to teach you things, to show you things. Now, he's not going to download it. It's as you begin to read and feed on God's Word that something changes on the inside of you. There's a, a powerful uh, version, portion of Scripture in Isaiah 59, 21. Listen to this and see if you recognize some incredible principles. As for me, says the Lord, this is my a covenant, my agreement with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from your mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. What's he saying? He's teaching you and I that the promises of God, the principles of the cross, don't just hope that your kids go to church. Don't just hope that your, your grandkids will know Jesus. What do you do as an adult? Are you teaching your children to speak what the Word says rather than to speak what the world says? Are you teaching them to speak what the Bible promises than the pain and the suffering they're experiencing? Because whatever your mouth is, 
is full of is what you are prophesying into your future. Every human being on the planet is a self-proclaiming prophet. What you are speaking and believing is what you are allowing into our futures. Now you might say, well, I didn't even allow that. Okay, well then you haven't learned and grown in the things of God to begin to speak the promises to push that aside. And here's where so many people get offended because I've got losses and I've had painful things happen to me and people I've loved have left early and, and stuff I wanted didn't happen. And, and the second I get offended, is when I'm blaming God, blaming the devil, blaming my leaders, blaming my spouse, blaming my parents, blaming somebody. But when I can recognize, no, 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 I'm done with the blame game. I'm done. It's me that's limiting God. Oh, when I begin to finally go, thank you, Jesus. Because if it's me, I can change me. It says here as well in Isaiah 59, 19, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You've heard that verse. Do you know what it means? It means that regardless of how the enemy comes in, I don't care if he comes in through viruses. I don't care if he comes in through a country. I don't care if he comes in through wrong leadership. I don't care where he comes in. If there is a people who are called by his name who will speak the promises and stand up and make their life count, the Bible says he'll lift up a standard. That word standard is kind of unique. When you look it up in the Bible, it literally means there is some kind of a thing that goes on if any enemy attacks you and they begin to run in terror is what it means. Something is lifted up from by the Spirit of God, whether it's the angels of God. And it doesn't even say how or what. It just says whatever that attack is, it begins to run from you in terror. One of the promises of God says that your enemies will come at you one way and flee before you seven ways. They might even have a concerted attack on you. They might be all coming together to take you out. But man, when they run into the standard, the, the defense system that God has placed there, it says they'll just turn and run. And over and over again, God's people in the Old Testament saw it. Whether it was Gideon, and whether it was all these great men and women, and it says that whole country's armies that banded together Together to take out God's people, it says they ran for fear and they just collected up all the wealth and the things that they left behind. Why do Christians wait until they're sick and then try to believe God? You are to begin to speak the word of God that says it doesn't even come near my dwelling. It doesn't come anywhere near my family. It doesn't come anywhere near my home. This is what the word of God says. My challenge to you, let's begin to recognize today there is nothing outside of you that is limiting you. So if the enemy can get you looking at him, if they can get you looking at God as his culprit, you know, it's kind of funny how the devil got Eve to look at God as the one who was stopping her from becoming all she could be. That's exactly what happened. You know, God knows the day you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. You know, the crazy thing was, she was already like him. She was made in his likeness and image. Adam and Eve were two kids of God, children of God. And yet somehow, and he's still doing that today, making you think like coming to church and knowing Jesus isn't where the greatest joy is. One of the things I teach our kids, and, and whenever I would do youth, I'd always explain to them, there is no blessing that God has placed on this planet that isn't better with God. You're going to party better when you recognize that he has placed guidelines on it. You're going to have an amazing sex life when you get married and recognize this beautiful gift, okay, also has sharp edges that can hurt you. The other day, we, or yesterday, we had a bunch of family over and, and uh, they were, we, were, we had some boiling oil or some oil that we were making some stuff up. And, uh, and so we have put a little sign up, hot oil, be careful. And I thought, well, it's kind of cool. You can kind of cook with it, but it's got a dangerous side. It's kind of like a knife. You can cut your bread, but don't let a three-year-old grab that knife. They'll cut themselves so bad they'll need stitches. Everything that is good, you hand a surgeon a knife, they'll cut that growth off and help you live longer. Hand a gangster that knife, he'll kill people. So many things where we say, well, God's just trying to stop me from having fun. No, he knows how to prosper you so your marriage lasts. So my challenge to you, 
Stop thinking that there's other things that are out there. Recognize the power of the Bible. Dive in there. Teach your kids. Teach your grandkids the wisdom of knowing Jesus, having him alive on the inside of you. And a closing thought I want to leave with you before we pray is when, when you look at God's word, it says here in Isaiah 59, 21, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth. Okay, stop right there. I have found as I continue to grow in the things of God that when any situation arises, because I have meditated and read through the Bible and just every day set aside a little bit of time to get to know Jesus and His Word, Holy Spirit will put a verse in my mouth. Many of the great um, old preachers I used to hang around with as a young boy would talk about God would, would literally cause a certain verse in the Bible to become real to them. It would rise up on the inside and they would begin to speak that promise. So many situations in our lives, Sal and I, where we're believing God for something, a, a verse that we've read and meditated will rise up and we'll begin to speak out loud. The Word says this. The Word says this. Just like Jesus did when he was trying, when not trying, when he was being tempted by the devil. He didn't just say, be gone. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. Why aren't you speaking the Word? That is a powerful form of meditation that plants the Word in your heart. And then as you speak the Word, it literally is prophesying your future. It is setting boundaries on the enemy out. It is setting realities for the angels of God and the Word of God to begin to go and to create a future for you that is beautiful, God-breathed, God-spoken. Stop letting the enemy attack your precious faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world and everything in the world, even our faith. We live in a world that is struggling with not belonging anywhere. This feeling of isolation, a feeling of disconnection. Um, so there's a lot of research going on right now about this because many people struggling with mood disorders, many people with depression, um, and even many other mental illnesses. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for it. So this is not a message about how to. It's just saying that in all of these people's lives, almost without exception, they have this horrible feeling of I do not belong. I I'm lonely. I'm disconnected. They'll stare at their entire family at a family get together and feel like I don't belong. They'll live in a wonderful place filled with happy, great people and they'll feel disconnected. People leave marriages, they leave churches, they leave their families, their friendship circles, or they never develop them because they've always felt like, I don't belong. And then preachers always add to that by using messages out of context like, we're strangers in another land. We're foreigners just passing through. Heaven is our home. Now, that's an Old Testament teaching. And when you study this out, it's not true. And we'll get to that. But when they look at loneliness researchers, and we're doing a series on this, so I'm going to spend a little bit of introduction for each of these messages. Um, they know that it, it shortens your lifespan. You know, they did a, the tests that were being done or the, uh, the studies that these universities are doing are saying that when you look at a, a human being's lifespan, pollution can compromise your lifespan 5%. Obesity, about 20%. Excessive drinking, 30%. Loneliness, 45%. One of the stats I'm aware of is that usually women outlive men between 7 to 10 years longer if they're the same age. And people often wonder why, and they've got lots of different ideas. You know, in 35 years of pastoring and counseling with families and couples and doing marriages and funerals, for a couple decades, three decades now. I'll tell you what I think. I believe that men are lousy, for example, at building relationships, friendships, opening up and talking and, and having a circle that gets bigger. So they're lonelier often, and they'll tell me that. And many of them die 
when they're older, just alone. And, and they're telling us that this loneliness, this feeling of disconnected, this feeling of I don't belong uh, there is, shortens our lifespan horribly. So today I want to talk about that because the enemy of our souls is the biggest mind game player on the planet. And he knows how to take this and to isolate you and to make you feel isolated and, and to bring people across your path that might say things or do things so that you feel like everyone's like this. In fact, I did this series in our church and everybody that I talked to uh, was stunned by the fact they thought they were the only one. Well, if the enemy wants to get you out of a life-giving church, just make you feel like you're disconnected. Greatest mistake that people make as well is they're always believing their thinking. That's crazy. You can't believe your thinking. If you believe your thinking, you're going to think everything in your head is true. And I'd say 80% of the stuff minimum that goes through your head is not true. It's you processing thinking, and it always seems to go negative until you go through the process of renewing your mind, establishing your heart, fellowshipping with Holy Spirit, staying filled with the Spirit. These things are paramount. They're so important. And so today I'm going to dive down a little deeper. We've taught so far, just kind of skimmed along the surface, outlining this huge problem that is there even for born-again, Spirit-filled believers. Now, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are a three-part being. You have a body. This is your earth suit. This is my earth suit. And I have a mind, a will, emotions that are all in my head. We call that the soul. Then you are a spirit. Deep inside of you, there's an inner man that is the real you. When Jesus comes into your life, forgives you, and you become born again, his presence completely changes your nature completely changes you from a nature of fear and sin to a nature of joy, faith, love. Uh, and that's deep in your spirit. And Holy Spirit is sealed in there, meaning the Bible says that he's sealed inside of us, that you, you can't get rid of him. You, know, you can't make a mistake tomorrow and, oh, he's gone. Uh, so then we need to renew our minds so we're not living in our old way of thinking. So today I want to talk about God's grace and then how to live by faith. There's a verse in the Bible that says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Okay, stop right there. We've got to talk about this. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are born again. You are born of God. That means that his presence, Holy Spirit, is deep in your spirit. And you have access to him in there. He's no longer up there where you're begging and bugging and pleading, God, help me! No, he's inside of you. And Romans 8 teaches us that he flows out of your innermost being. And so whatever is born of God, if you are born again, there is not a thing on this planet that can overcome you. You know, one of the things in my ministry that has happened quite often is people who are really demonically oppressed or even possessed that see weird things and are controlled by stuff, uh, they'll, they'll come for help. And they often wonder, you know, if I have the power to help them because they're so in awe of the devil's power. They've seen what he does. They've seen little signs and wonders from the enemy that makes them think he's all powerful. Or they've talked to Christians who don't know how to do it. No, there is nothing on this planet, no demonic power, no force of sickness, no force of anything that can overcome a believer because it says for whatever is born of God, overcomes poverty, sickness, depression, unhappiness. And you and I need to know this. This verse goes on to explain what overcomes the world. And this is the victory. If you want to walk in victory in every area of your life, this is it. This is what overcomes the world. Our faith. Now someone says right away, oh, okay, I've heard that before. I just don't have enough. Now it's not saying how much faith. Faith is about what you believe in. You know, I believe there's been a mistake made in much of the teaching on faith to the, to, the, to the world. I'm glad for the resurgence of the teaching on faith. But it tends to look at how much you've got. So when people are believing God for a miracle in their home, their marriage, you know, the, the peace of God in their own life, dealing with depression, sickness, uh, they tend to think, well, it's not happening, so I don't have enough faith. And then they look at trying to get more, trying to get more, trying to get more, or God's withholding it. 
etc. But, but you have to understand something. Everyone's been given the measure of faith. So it's not about having more, it's what you believe. Often, I would meet with people and when they finally opened up and talked about their situation, they would always share with me that, that you know, I know that God is a good God, that God heals, and then they'd always have this but, but you know, and they'd tell me that maybe they'd had an abortion or that, you know, they had maybe committed adultery on their spouse and the spouse never heard about it. And they hid that and no one knows what I did in my last life. And one person told me how they were pretty sure they killed a person. Uh, and then they ran from the scene with their vehicle and never did go back. And, and they, just story after story. So in other words, they have this misbelief that there's something in their life that disqualifies them from this miracle. So when you're believing God for your life to be fuller, for peace, for joy, for healing, for freedom, for God to bless you and for you to rise up filled with joy and peace and success, what stops it is often a misbelief. It is something that the enemy has shot into your head that you believe. Now, this verse goes on, and it actually talks about this. It says, who is he who overcomes the world? So who are the people that do this? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It doesn't say who overcomes the world? Those whose lives are perfect. No, it doesn't say that. Those who work everything out, every mess they've ever had. No, it doesn't say that. It says the overcomers believe on Jesus. Now, right there, a lot of people have a disconnect. But well, what does that mean to believe on Jesus? Okay, I don't know if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I, I struggle with that. Did he was it a virgin birth? Did he arise again? Did he did he come out of the grave? Like all these things, I don't know. History just says we can prove he walked the planet. But all the other the historical Jesus has been proven. Okay, there's so many records besides the Bible that this Jesus Christ was alive at that time frame. Others wrote about him. Even Roman leaders wrote about him. So we know that Jesus walked the planet. The issue is, was he the son of God? Did he really die and rise again? Did he really take the sins of the world? Did he really go into heaven? All of these things are the things people struggle with. So this is where you must look into the Bible and you must study Jesus. One person talked to me one time, you know, I really want to be free from my addiction and so I've just been studying every scripture I can on faith. And I said, that's good. Others said, I'm believing God for healing. So I've been studying every promise in the Bible uh, that teaches healing. And I said, good. Others will tell me I've been believing for my marriage to be restored. So I'm going through everywhere in the word that gives advice on marriage and promises on marriage. And, 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 and every time I hear that, I say, good. However, there's something that most Christians miss. And it's covered in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 to 5. And it talks about how faith triumphs in the troubled times of our lives. And it says here, <clears throat> Therefore, having been justified by faith. The word justified is very similar to the word righteous. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. And righteousness, I, I like little plays on words to help people remember them. Righteousness means in right standing with God. Righteous in God, righteousness. So it says you've been justified by faith. You are justified by what you believe. And then it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into Healing, no. Into prosperity, no. Into deliverance, no. What does faith do? It gives us access to grace. There's a missing link for many faith believers, many people who are believing God for miracles and situations to go away in their life. They And, and it's important to know the promises. It's important to understand. But this is very much so focusing on if you want to walk in victory, study Jesus, believe Jesus. Well, what does that mean? It's what he did. It's what Jesus has done. Jesus went on the cross. He died for you and I. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. We, we call that from the cross to the throne. This spiritual period of time, or it was a period of time, but the things that happened there are not written in one story. 
They're found buried in a beautiful code all through the Old Testament. These are the scriptures that Paul and Peter referred to. And they begin to quote all these verses that were hidden in the Old The Bible says it was so magnificent that if Satan would have understood this, he'd have never touched or crucified Jesus. It was the biggest mistake he ever made because Jesus died for you and I. As you begin to study, really study what the cross is, why he died in our place, how he exchanged his life for our life. He took our mess, our sin, our fear, our guilt. We took his peace. It says here, we have peace with God. Not because we deserve peace, but through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, anytime. Any time that you need to see the glory of God, or let's put it this way, because everyone argues about what the word glory means. We've got so many crazy uh, definitions of God's glory. You know, God's glory is his results, his presence flowing in our lives. And so when God flows through us, when a man and a woman is walking in their gifting, you can see God's glory, because it's not them, it's his presence, his results, his power flowing through you and I. So we have access by faith into this grace. And I want to camp on this for the remainder of this message because I've heard so many times, literally weekly, I'll hear someone that hasn't seen victory in their life and they'll look at me with tears in their eyes. I've got faith. I believe. You know, or they've lost a loved one or a friend of theirs died believing God for a miracle. And they'll say things like, I know they had faith. You can't, nobody can tell me they didn't have faith. Well, I totally agree with you. That of course they had faith. Every believer has the exact same amount. They got the same measure. But what you do with your faith is important. The Bible says that what we need to do with our faith is access grace. And then we stand in this grace. We rejoice in the glory of God. And then it goes on to say, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's a story that will help you. When I was a young man, my dad taught me in grade school that I should never fight. Leon, we don't fight. We love God. We love people. We don't fight with people. And he forbade me to fight. Now, in the town that we grew up in, Weldon, Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, I, I went to school there. And because, for some reason, because my dad was a pastor, I was persecuted. And, and, I, had a, and, and I have an acute sense of not belonging and being rejected because of it, I would be teased about being a pastor's son and, and a Christian. And they would, right from grade four and on, I have memories of this. And so finally one day, I was getting beat up so much by even the little kids at school because they knew that they could actually punch me in the face and I would never touch them. They knew they could tackle me on the ground, hit me with stuff, throw rocks at me, and I would just duck my head and try to escape uh, because I was forbidden to fight back. Hey everybody, it is great to have you with me today because the topic today is crucial for you to break through storms and to walk in a consistent place of miracles and success and overcoming faith, lives, etc. This message today is so crucial. All right, let me start with a verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. It says, rejoice always. How often? Always. Now the word rejoice, the word joy is at the root. So you can have joy, but it's not enough to have joy. You are to rejoice, which means do something with this joy that's in your heart. Rejoice, and how often? Always. It doesn't say in brackets, except in trouble, except in crises, except in sickness, except when you've had the worst day of your life. So that's a pretty crazy word. Rejoice always. Then it says, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I want you to notice something here that is a religious issue. A lot of people think that we are to thank God for everything. 
that would be so horrible and so wrong and so far out of God's will. I could think of a situation right now. A friend gets raped. Thank God for it. Are you kidding me? Not a chance. So we don't thank God for the heartache, the pain, the disgusting, sinful, brutal things that, that the enemy can bring at times into people's lives. Not a chance. It says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We, so in other words, rejoicing, praising God, giving thanks has nothing to do with how you feel. It is a command from God. He doesn't say, hey, you guys, hope you can do this once in a while. No, he says, rejoice always. It's like this strength command. Pray without ceasing. Now, that word pray without ceasing, doesn't prayer is not begging God, bugging God, pleading with God. No, prayer is a faith-filled declaring to mountains. Prayer is also a relationship of communing and hanging out with God and spending time with God. The other day I was on a, a tell or a movie set and and one of the people there was listening to me talk and and she said can I ask you a question how much do you pray every day and I said well I said actually the word prayer means fellowshipping with God so I guess all the time what does that mean it means like he's with me if you ask me how much time I fellowship with Sally my wife I'd have to go like all day I'm with her all day we're communicating by making her a cup of coffee, her making me some toast, uh, smiling, looking at things together, talking, uh, laughing, touching. All of this has got to do with communicating with her. And uh, so with God, prayer is two things. It's communication, hanging out, talking, listening, uh, explaining, going into his word with him. And then the second thing it is, is prayer is an act of commanding the things around you, mountains to move and, and stuff to happen. So Pray without ceasing. Just stay connected to God. Enjoy him. Thank him. In fact, thanking him and praising him is prayer. That's one of the many different kinds of prayer is just thanking him, praising him. Hey, God, it's so good today. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for amazing things are going to happen with my appointments, who I'm going to meet. I'm thanking you right now. Today's going to be a great day. Just hanging out with you all day is good. I mean, God, you're awesome. That's kind of the conversations I have with God. I, just, I enjoy him so much. He's so amazing, so awesome. So I want to go back into in everything, give thanks. Let's take a look at this and let's help you get from the doldrums, the depression, the horrible unhappiness. Um, maybe something horribly bad has happened to you. You're in the midst of a loss and you just want to literally live in depression. You know, you don't feel like you even have a right to rejoice. First of all, rejoicing and praising him and giving thanks to him has nothing to do with your emotions has to do with a powerful overcoming spirit that'll take you through the stuff that is going on in your life. Well, let's go to an example of what I'm saying first in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. Here it says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. They're in jail. They're singing. Suddenly, now, when we go further on, you'll notice they were chained. And by the way, a Roman prison wasn't a cute little thing like we have today with a nice orange suit, new shoes, new underwear, um, you know, three square meals a day, access to coffee, uh, and some of them even have televisions and books and your own little library. You know, a Roman prison was a rat infested hellhole where you were chained up. And they didn't care if it caused a rash or it ripped your skin open and blood was trickling down. Rats were running through. Everybody else's feces and urine are everywhere. This was a hellhole. They did not make prisons cute. This is where Paul and Silas were. When they put them into jail, they had whipped them. So their backs were open and bleeding. And if you've ever had someone whip your back, even just for fun with a willow or something, the nerve endings in your back are so brutal. So to have them ripped up, I mean, these guys have nothing to be thankful about. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and all the doors were opened and 
everyone's chains were loosed. All right, as we get into this thing, I want you to notice in the middle of pain, loss of freedom, in the middle of what looks like failure, in the middle of looks like bad happenings, they didn't thank God for it. They were praising and singing hymns to God in the midst of it. And not only did they get a miracle, but everybody around them. You know, as a pastor of a large church and other organizations, a television station and private schools and, and an organization that takes TV and languages around the world, whenever I'm around people, the, the culture of these organizations is up to me. Am I going to be praising and thanking even when I'm believing God for millions and wondering what's going to happen next? Can I be praising God, giving Him thanks, trusting Him so that everybody around me shares in the victory? I've always believed that the people working with me, volunteering with me, attending our organizations would have the blessing of God upon them financially, marriage-wise, health-wise, that as I'm praising and thankful and declaring God's goodness, that everybody around me would walk in that attitude and in that blessing. It's happening here. In fact, these prisoners were probably thieves, killers, liars. I mean, that, and they're getting blessed because of the praise and the worshiping attitude of Paul and Silas. It says, everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. So then it says, Then he called for a light ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. The reason he was about to kill himself is because if a Roman soldier or anybody was involved in the holding of prisoners, if you fell asleep and lost them, didn't do your job and they escaped, that was instant death. There's, there was no tribunal, there was no have a big meeting about it, just every soldier involved in keeping that prisoner. A captive was just killed, so you knew these guys were going to be brutal and hang on to you. So he's about to kill himself rather than be killed. And Paul told him this to stop. And he runs in trembling before Paul and Silas and he brought them out. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This jailer had jailed people for days, weeks, months, years. He knew exactly how tough that prison was. He knew how hard it was to open those prisons. He knew all of this. He had never been in a situation where every door blew open, now they chained them up. And when they chained them up, they, they used that technology then of locking those chains around them, making sure that the shackles were on feet, uh, hands, neck. They were, didn't want them going anywhere. And he knew that every prisoner in this prison, instantly the hands came free, the neck came free, the, the ankles came free, the, every one of their doors blew open, and it was so powerful the foundations of the prison were shaken. He knew what was taking place here was beyond anything any man could do. No one could run from cell to cell, popping doors, ankles, bracelets. This was God. And he said, sir, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him so that all and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes. Immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God and with all his household. All right. Today in the church world, we don't have a lot of miracles taking place. I know, I travel from denomination to denomination, and it's just rare. And people have been taught why miracles don't happen. People have been taught, you know, God's allowed this to teach you something, because he's such a lousy teacher, he couldn't teach you through the word. He'd have to kill somebody, bankrupt something, make you sick, or whatever dumb doctrines they've got. Today, we really don't thank him in the midst of problem. Praise him for the answer, even before it happens. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
and the evidence of things not seen, they were praising God, believing. Their job wasn't done. Paul had a knowing as to what God had called him to. In fact, at the end of his life, when he really did die, he knew it. And he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to get a crown, something that God has for me. He knew, and he knew it wasn't his time then. He was praising God in faith. He was declaring the goodness of God. He knew the armies of heaven were greater than the armies of Rome. He knew the message of Jesus was more powerful than the message of Caesar. And he was just praising him and thanking him. This was a minor thing. Oh, it was major to most people. Whipped, beaten. I mean, they're in chains. Impossible. I mean, they could have been killed. They killed prisoners back then for anything. And for any reason. I mean, they just killed people so easily. There was no value for human life. Later on, they hung Christians on crosses as far as the eye could see. Fed them to lions. Killed them. Raped them. Killed their children their wives. <laughs> these, these people had no problem killing. Paul and Silas. Praising. Singing to God. I wonder if we do that in the midst of our problems. I remember the last time if you were sick laying in bed, wondering if you're going to make it. If you begin to say, just a minute, just give me a few minutes here. God, I thank you. I praise you. I'm wonderfully made. Your promises work. They're mine. I've got a long life ahead of me. Health and healing are the promises you've given me. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing. Believe it, I'm in pain. You ought to be whipped by a Roman soldier, locked in a Roman prison, put chains on every part of you. That whipping wasn't a cute little thing. They ripped up their backs. The pain was excruciating and off the charts. They knew how to punish men, brutal men. And they're thanking and praising God. Not because you feel like it. Someone says, well, Leon, if you don't feel like praising God, then it's not real. It's not true. Okay, you are a person who lives by your emotions. You think that if you don't emotionally feel like it, that you're not being authentic. Are you kidding me? You don't get up and go to work because you feel like it. You get up and go to work because you need to, and it's right to do it. And money's got to be made, and bills have to be paid, and your children have to be fed. And you've promised them that you would work for them for this much an hour. And you've promised them to be at work on time, 8 o'clock sharp. And so you don't say, well, I just don't feel like it. We live in a generation who really think their feelings are accurate and they get to live by them and they should follow them and that they're real. Oh, we know feelings are real, but they're not accurate and they're not truth. What situation are you in? Middle of a divorce? Middle of a bankruptcy? Are you sick? Maybe even being given up to die. I can hear someone thinking, you know, Leon, you're just not sensitive. You have no idea what it's like to be dying, laying in the hospital. The world, everybody's going to die. Everyone experiences sickness. What the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to give up, curl into the fetal position and suck our thumbs and just give up. And oh, woe is me. We want everyone to understand the pain that we're going through. And it's important to us for them to know how much pain and heartache we've got. I know this is hard for some of you listening, but listen to me. When I was a paramedic, I remember one time coming to a scene where a man had had a front-end loader drive into him and the shovel in front hit his legs, his knees, and crushed them into a cement wall. He collapsed on the spot with the joints destroyed, bones destroyed. In fact, as he was sitting there, his legs just turned unnaturally in the wrong direction. When I came on the scene, he was screaming in pain. And as I came to him with my bag full of drugs and equipment, he looked at me and he didn't go, Just a minute, just a minute. Do you know how I feel right now? He didn't care about me knowing how I felt. I didn't stop and look and say, you know, I know how you feel right now. He didn't care if I felt like him, and I didn't care. He looked at me and screamed, help me, give me something for pain. It wasn't, we didn't have an emotional bond. It was a cry for help, and it was a man trained to bring relief. In God's word, we need to get out of all of these little emotional things about, well, I just want people to know how rough this is. Why? What's the purpose? Do you really need that? But now, please love me and listen to this. Do you want to be free? Do you want to rise up and win? Do you want to get up and...